Hey everyone, there is currently a storm going on outside of my house, which seems like, while it may affect the audio quality of the video, seems an appropriate backdrop for a look into Night City here with Cyberpunk 2077. It's been a while. Um, welcome back to Devon Talks Tabletop. I appreciate it, guys. This is the YouTube channel where the games are made up and what I say doesn't matter. But if you are a fan of Cyberpunk 2077, if you're a fan of The Witcher, of CD Projekt Red, or Go On Board's previous Kickstarter offerings, you might want to listen up because I will be chatting about the upcoming campaign that is coming out. And this is yet another unique design from them and I am thoroughly excited. My first experience with this was almost a year ago now at Essen in 2023 and now leading up to the new campaign that's about to launch in Essen 2024. It's exciting to look at not only a more uh, up-to-date or revised demo version of the game but also just see the progression that they've come with the design. I'm going to give an overview of what this is, some qualifiers to help you understand uh, what this game might be and why it might be something that will appeal to you and just, I, I guess, exude some excitement for both this IP and then also for the gameplay design that Go On Board has achieved here, which is something that I like a lot and is yet again different from their previous iterations. So if you're unfamiliar with Go On Board, or even if you are familiar with them, they started off with The Witcher Old World, which is right there. And that was kind of a fantasy RPG-ish adventure strategy game set in The Witcher world, The Witcher universe, in collaboration with CD Projekt Red. But at its heart, even though it was an adventure game, a fun strategy game, they have some really interesting card design that plays into how you attack both the monsters that you're hunting as a witcher and then also sometimes the other witchers if you want to get into a little bit of a fracas with them. They then continued their... Uh... Man... The world is opening up outside. The heavens are opening up. And there's rain, which seems like the appropriate... Like, it, it, cyberpunk and rain go hand in hand. So, honestly, I should open up the windows, let it in, and then just keep talking and revel in the theme. But the next thing that they did was continue working with The Witcher IP, continue their uh, relationship with CD Projekt Red, and come out with Path of Destiny which I got to try out two Gen Cons ago at this point. And that was, once again, an, an exciting, interesting, uh, a little bit more of a Euro-style game in terms of how some of the scoring mechanics work, uh, but combines storytelling and narrative in a really interesting way where you get to be pushing through the familiar tales of Geralt of Rivia and The Witcher and kind of deciding where those stories go. So if you've watched the TV show or if you've read The Last Wish, that world was familiar to you, except how you decide to navigate it was unique to each playthrough of Path of Destiny. And just like in the old world, kind of the most noticeable thing for me was how interesting the card play was and it's something that they have shown that they're very good at it go on board is creating unique card play mechanics that have a whole game kind of uh revolving around them and they've done that with cyberpunk 2077 so once again in partnership with cd project red except this time moving over to their other ip so instead of the witcher we're now in cyberpunk 2077 which has had some really dramatic growth since it first came out so it had the phantom liberty expansion it had somewhat of a tumultuous beginning and then like other games that um trying to think of that space game that had a rough start and then really kind of came into it. No Man's Sky, like No Man's Sky, kind of came into its own after launch and really became what it was supposed to be in the minds of the viewers and probably the minds of the designers. 
you know, that kind of final product that was offered. So Phantom Liberty was a nice capstone to the achievements of 2077. So building off of all that success, why not a board game? So if you're familiar with the crowdfunding scene, with the board game, uh, you know, Kickstarter game found world, you might have remembered that there was a Gangs of Night City Cyberpunk 2077 board game from CMON. This is <laughs> nothing like that. Uh, they really have so much going on differently. And I, I've covered both of those, I've played both of those. And other than the fact that they share the same IP, just completely different. Gangs of Night, Night City functioned much more like The Godfather, which was a previous CMON offering. This is a story-driven, really interesting real-time game. So it's got something in here called STAP, which is a sequential timed action phase. And that mechanic brings front and center the card play design that they have worked on repeatedly across their games and built a completely new experience uh, based off of that. So, and I, I'm saying, I guess, like their process of approaching card play, not the fact that this card play is the same as the other ones. It's not, it's different. But it's just, they really have like returned to the well in a good way uh, with what they're doing here. So this sequential timed action phase, what is that? The best way to describe it is to use the term real time, but qualify that with some caveats to where it doesn't, I guess, scare people away. Real time has uh, this sense of maybe chaos or disorganization attached to it that things are happening and you don't really get the time and the uh, capacity to plan to like dive into strategy in the way that you want to. And this is more uh, ordered. It is more thought out in terms of mitigating anything that might be a negative of real time while escalating the tension and the excitement to where it really does mirror the feeling of like when you're playing the video game. So if, if, you've, if you're not familiar with Cyberpunk 2077, it's a big, grandiose, like action RPG experience in Night City. There's a whole host of like different districts, different gangs, and you are these different like edge runners who are kind of mercenaries or, you know, free spirits that are trying to find their way in the city. And the main protagonist in that is V. If you have played the video game, if you're familiar with the video game, this will narratively be really interesting in the fact that it is an alternate storyline, an alternate universe. You are V, you are Jackie, but instead of going to Kunpeki Plaza, which if you're familiar with the game, sets off a whole chain of events that I'm not going to spoil in case some of you haven't played the game and would like to do so. You don't go to Kunpeki Plaza because there's this mysterious fixer named Seer and they decide to halt that and prevent it from happening and encourage you elsewhere. You still interact with Pan Am Palmer, with Judy Alvarez, with all of these different characters, and so you get to enjoy the exact same rich world, but you aren't railroaded by what has to happen because of the video game. You get to explore a whole new echo of Night City by playing in this alternate timeline, this alternate storyline. So this in front of you is a, it's a demo version. It's not like a full prototype that hosts everything. Go check out the, cam, the Game Found pre-campaign page and you can see everything that is already being shared. There's the first stretch goal that's been revealed, which is really cool. You can see that this is a game 
where the, the core box, it's, it's offering 13 missions across four story arcs with a finale that you can enjoy. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. And then after you finish that campaign and possibly any other stretch goal or expansion content that might be revealed, you also have this like endless mission generator through the afterlife bar. Again, connected to the video game and the world of Night City, the afterlife is kind of where fixers and ed edge runners meet and they, they give out jobs and you return back. This is really kind of like thematically cool. I'm okay with the fact, I mean, I'll, first off, I love rainstorms and thunderstorms. They sound awesome and are cool, but I can't tell if this is like a good omen or a bad omen, but I'm just gonna keep rolling with it. So in this game, you are these titular characters or these main these main protagonists from the world of cyberpunk 2077 but you're creating your own storyline with it in this sequential timed action phase this stat mechanic what you have is you have your cards your deck will be specific to your character it will be somewhat leaning in a particular direction you've got four different types of actions you've got the ability to heal yourself and to move. You've got the ability to move and to navigate uh, or build up your RAM for uh, quick hacks and stuff like that. You've also got uh, the ability to interact, to move around the world, and then the ability to deal damage, which is also important. Uh, when you come across these guards that might be in these corporate buildings that you're infiltrating. So those cards, have symbols on them. Those symbols are marked into rows and you don't have all of the rows unlocked, especially when you start. When you start, you'll only have one row in every type of card available. And so as you get um, improvements or upgrades, you'll be able to start unlocking additional action resolutions, which is important because as the game progresses, as it gets harder, you're gonna need to do more things, uh, you know, as you move or as you download RAM or get RAM or as you attack, you'll, you'll want to build up some momentum as these stories progress and they get harder and the complexity of what you have to achieve is, is going to force you to upgrade to be able to handle the load or the burden of the story that's kind of coming across at the table. In this demo version, I've got prologues. There's three of them, and in each prologue, it will successively add more rules, more layers to this puzzle, and it will progress from being, hey, go do this, take out these guards, or go to these spots. As you can see, there's uh, you know D and A and B and C in different locations around here. Um, actually, I'm supposed to put this guy right here. Whoopsie daisy. I'm supposed to put this guy right here. That makes way more sense. And this guy's actually supposed to go right here. I did that for you. I did that for you. So as you can see, there's A, B, C, D. These will be locations that you'll need to reach. When you start off on this central node in this elevator, there are different upgrades that you'll pick up along the way that may give you cards. They may give you uh, higher efficiency with certain types of cards in your hand. They may also give you benefits as well. You may pick up more boosts along the way, which give you kind of one-time refreshable uh, icon resolutions, whether it's moving or shooting or interacting or RAM or whatever. You have your quick hacks that are specific to your character. There's a whole host of things that can interact with your action phase. And that's where we'll jump into the real-time discussion. So this game can be played with an app. I like using the app. If you do not want to use the app, you do not have to. It is not a requirement. It just kind of facilitates the gameplay in a way by taking certain elements out of your hands for maintenance and allows you to get into the game faster. So I like it, but it's not a requirement. If you're not someone who's interested in apps, you can enjoy this entirely without that. What the apps do though, is they control or uh, regulate your action phases. This stat mechanic that I keep referring to, 
may give you two minutes, maybe it gives you three minutes. Maybe you add more time throughout that existing round to where it's a little bit fuller than it would normally be. But in that time, you and any other players at the table are going to be alternating your resolution of these cards. Maybe you just got hit by a guard, so you're like, you know what, I need to heal up and then I'm gonna move out of the way. And then someone else goes, you know what, we need to do something uh, with a quick hack at this particular location. I'm gonna juice up my ram, and then I'm gonna head that way because we need to get that done. Someone else might say, you know what? I've got some doors that are in between me and some upgrades. I feel really light right now. I'm gonna go ahead, move through those, and I don't have enough movement actually, so I'm gonna flip over my booster and then do that. And then you're picking up one new card every time, making sure you refresh your hand. You're like, oh, you know what? Actually, I'm gonna distract this guard. I need them to go through this door so that I have a clear path. You know what? You know, st st stealth out the door. I need to attack this guard, get in there. I'm gonna rush in and hit him before he has a chance to react to me. It's not one player resolving their whole hand and going all at once because it's simulating that simultaneous, that progressive uh, like rush that you have in the video game. You, sometimes you'll see those clips online and maybe someone's slowing time and doing a whole bunch of stuff. That happens, but it happens in a little bit more truncated fashion. They're kind of split up into short bursts of action per player. Another reason why you need those short actions per player is because the guards and the adversaries, the you know antagonistic forces of whatever level, whatever story you're on, have to respond to you. And so the next time, whoever was attacking the guard initially, before they get to go the next time, they're actually going to get attacked by the guard. Maybe they'll deal some damage or maybe they won't, and then they're gonna take a hit. And if they take more hits beyond whatever health they have, then they're going to take some wounds. These wounds are just gonna clog up their hands. So the next time, whenever they're drawing, they have fewer options because now they have a wound and it's clogging up their hand. It's clogging up the ability for them to respond as fully as they could. They get more of those, it's gonna continue to fill up. And there might be lose conditions on a story where if you get a certain amount of wounds, it's over. And all of that plays in a really quick succession. And then you finish a action round and then you have a reset fear period. You might go ahead and upgrade anything based off of the loot that you found. You might go ahead and reshuffle your hand. There's several different steps that you'll go through progressively. The enemies might move and they might react to where you're going or where you've been. And so all of that takes place in a in a period of rest that happens as quickly as you can resolve the maintenance on the board, you start another action phase. So maybe you left off and you were heading towards a certain objective and, and you're off to the races again. You're going to move, you're going to heal because you just got hit this last round. You're going to go through that door and you're progressing and you're moving around the map. Each player has their own unique uh, kind of cards that will tailor them towards a certain style of play, but also the direction that you move on the board will somewhat dictate what you want to upgrade to. If you're gonna move into the green section, that means you are naturally filling your character in that particular scenario, in that particular round, towards a more advantageous, ram-heavy, and green card focus. If you're pushing up towards red, you might kind of be that tank, that Jackie who says, you know what, stealth isn't necessary, I'm gonna go out guns blazing and take out these guards. You have Arasaka, you have Militech, these corporations uh, provide the playing field, the, the playground for you to be an edge runner on, and narratively, you're going to have certain smaller goals and certain larger goals that you're gonna progress through. There are upgrade cards that are much stronger than maybe what you start off with. Uh, for example, this one here, you need to be on the third stretch of the red, de the red skill to even be able to use it, but then it does six damage, which is stupid strong. It's useless until you get that skill level unlocked, but when you do, it can be a very, very valuable, uh, strong hit. There's all these other options busting through doors, uh, giving more time during the action phase, uh, loading up on RAM. You've got a lot of things to consider and that time phase, that real time element that leaks in or bleeds into the game provides a satisfying level of tension. 
it does not make it uh, impossible. It's not such a short amount of time that you can't get the objectives done, but it is short enough that you can't plan to perfection. You do have to somewhat react on the fly and build a strategy as you go. You can't min-max from the beginning. Maybe you set yourself up for a really satisfying turn, but you do that fluidly. You do that while you're playing, not um, you know in a relatively agonizing paralysis around the table where players are racked by indecision and they're not doing something. You're always doing something. Uh, the question is how efficiently are you doing it? How successfully are you doing it? As the story will progress, how successfully you do it may, may drop down. Your percentage of uh, excellence may, may drop, but I think in doing so, it inspires you to some really creative play and some really satisfying conclusions to an action round where you realize, man, that was just two minutes, but we really accomplished a lot. And we went around the table and multiple players keyed off really, you know, several objectives in one go. And it can feel really, really satisfying whenever you're able to do that. There are things that they're going to reveal in the campaign that I don't know. There are some things that they're going to reveal in the campaign that I do know and I'm not sharing with you because I just get to know it and you'll find out soon enough. What I can say is that they have, in my determination, succeeded again at creating a compelling gameplay offering that tw mutates their card gameplay or their card driven mechanics successfully again. It, it really does work and it feels good. There's this, you know, I almost urge to want to play out your whole hand, but again, then you, you, the players at the table would have to wait for you. You would be focused on trying to figure out the best combination of when to layer them out, and then the enemies wouldn't feel as robust. They wouldn't feel as threatening because you're able to do so much prior to them reacting. This sequential timed action phase where the players alternate and you're really layering turns back and forth, it can feel uh, sometimes like you're like, oh man, just let me play this next card or I, I want to do stuff. But there are ways around that to where you can create really significant moments even with just one card of play, especially once you've unlocked certain levels in your skills. You can do quite a bit with one card and then you've got these boosts and these boosts are able to be refreshed uh, anytime you bump your health up all the way past uh, the highest value, you can refresh the booster and then you're able to use it again. And just this singular icon is really useful. And if real time wasn't enough to keep you engaged when you weren't the one doing an action, they also have these quick hacks. In these quick hacks, you have options where you can expend or use your RAM to benefit you, but it actually costs less for you to benefit another player. Are they just one move away from that door that they're trying to interact with? Cool, boom, I got you and on your turn, I'm helping you out. And that level of interaction where we're trying to plan as a team the best path through to these objectives is an ongoing conversation. It's happening simultaneous to the gameplay where someone might be playing and the other person is audibly discussing the best resolution of that turn setting up the next player's turn. And when the players are getting together like that, it's quite satisfying. There isn't an ability to really quarterback in this game because everybody's got their own deck, you've got your own things going on. There are some things that you'll unlock as the prologues and as the missions go further uh, where you can further build out your character in really exciting ways. And all of that means that you're the master of your own territory and on your turn, they're not going. Uh, and you might be heading towards objective C, they might be heading towards objective A. Guess what? They're not near you. You're, you're on your own in the sense that you're, you're the best navigator for your own options. They, they, they can't really, uh, in a timed phase, 
figure out what's best for you because they're, you're, they're wasting time. So everybody kind of gets to zero in on their skill set, on their strength, whatever advantage they have in the um, terrain, in the environment, they're able to exploit it and they feel just as good for doing that. And, and, and that's what I like a lot. So you've got the different characters. You've got Jackie, you've got V, you've got Pan Am, you've got Judy. There are some special ones. Why don't you go check out the campaign page and see for yourself who else might be popping up. But it really does feel like you're getting to bring that character to life on the table. Uh, Pan Am, for example, has an Overwatch ability. She's got a sniper rifle in the game. In this, well, I say in the game, in the video game, she's got a sniper rifle. And in this, she can shoot through walls. Coming over here, V's having difficulty with this. Pan Am could be over here, and you know, you know what? Boom! Penetrating, you know, round goes straight through there and helps to take out that guard, which is really satisfying. Uh, there's a Mantis Blades version of V. I don't know exactly where he is or where I put him, but it's a cool Mantis Blades version of V, which I don't have a visual for right now. But again, go check the campaign page because it's got it there. So, yeah. Sequential timed action phase, STAP. If you want to see in depth all of the different elements uh, and how they're planned to be nicer than this demo version, more, more fleshed out, all of the gameplay variables that you can explore if you decide to get this, the campaign page has all of that in much more exacting detail than I can provide. What I can say is that the first time I played this back at Essen in 2023, I had a blast. It was a very, very simple, uh, you know, early prototype of the game. It had not even nice, uh, you know, manufactured cardboard tiles like this. It was very, very simple. But what existed was that pure card play that I just had a blast with. Uh, and it, every time I play a game from them, I am uh, admiring what they're able to do with one particular mechanic and how it feels both the perfect thing to hold together the gameplay of whatever that design is and then also how well everything else complements it, especially in these IP settings. So in Path of Destiny, it felt like a card game. Um, I, you know, I, it, it didn't feel like Gwent in the sense of how Gwent plays, but it felt like I was in the universe of The Witcher and getting to tell a story with the cards that were there, the cards in my hand, and also uh, the, the moments there. And in Cyberpunk 2077 here, it really does feel like the video game. And I know that that's hard to, I guess, clarify what I mean, but because of how they've throttled real time to exist in a very narrowly set, but perfectly explorable way, which is, I, I did, did, I'm not sure that made sense. They have contained the best parts of real time in a manner that allows you to feel your pulse quicken and feel like there's an adrenaline rush, like a thief in the night moving through a guarded corporate building trying to secure an objective and get out before, you know, the Arisaka troops come in and storm and blitz you and you're trying to rush you're trying to push through you're trying to evade the guards that are there and then you take a quick break you hunker down behind a table you hunker down behind you know a half wall and while the guards are scouring the hallways while they're roaming trying to figure out what this disturbance is what this you know infiltration might mean and you take a breather and you reassess and you see what's going on and then you make the move for the next room and your partner's with you and you guys are jump, you know, you're sneaking back and forth, you're moving, one of you reacts to a guard, one of you, you know, hacks the panel to get you into the door, you guys push in, you find 
this nice Arasaka gun. One of you holsters that for a future encounter, you know, along the way. And then you keep going. You take a break, you reassess, you keep going. And it, it feels real <laughs> in a way that's satisfying. And so I, I can't wait to play this one um, beyond the demo version. So this was literally designed to teach me the game and to onboard me with the various layers that can be added and make the first experience enough to give you a taste, the second experience enough to show you what's possible, and the third experience enough to let you tinker and play around and see how to combine all of the composite pieces that make up this, this game. I like it. I like it a lot. I'm a fan of what Go On Board is doing. I'm excited for their next thing, which I um, won't talk about, but super stoked to see what all gets revealed in this campaign because this is definitely, I think it fulfills the potential of what a game is that has real time, but I also think it gives so many good considerations to how to make the players feel like they're the ones in control. Because sometimes in a real-time experience, you feel like you're not. But in this, I do feel like I'm in control. Doesn't mean you won't fail, but when you succeed, it makes it that much sweeter. If you guys have any questions, let me know. I may do another video, I'm not sure. But for right now, I feel like I've said what I wanted to say, and I'm excited for this board game I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.